Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today on another episode of Level Up Law, where we here at South Carolina Legal Services are leveling up your legal knowledge on the different areas of law that we practice in. I'm Susan Engel, Senior Staff Attorney with South Carolina Legal Services. I'll be the host of the webinar today, along with our producer, Kenneth Elliott, from our IT department here at Legal Services. We are joined today by SCLS Attorney Jessica Schultz from our office in Greenville, South Carolina. Jessica will be discussing guardianships and conservatorships. So this will be a really interesting topic for those of you who are joining us. As you view today's presentation, remember this is not legal advice, but just general information for the public. You should always consult with an attorney for any specific legal problems that you have. And I will mention that at the end of today's presentation, we will provide information on how to apply for free legal assistance here at South Carolina Legal Services, as well as how to access our public information and resources. As always, a recording of the webcast will be posted on our YouTube channel for South Carolina Legal Services later this week, along with the slides that Jessica will be using today. Even though you will be in listen-only mode, please be sure to take advantage of this opportunity and put any questions that you have for Jessica in the question box. As time allows, she will provide some general information to answer your questions. Again, thanks so much for joining us. And Jessica, let's get started. Thanks, Susie. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here today. And I am here to talk to you about guardianships and conservatorships in South Carolina. Today, today I'm going to hit on um, a couple of different questions. So what is a guardianship? What is a conservatorship? And what is the difference between the two? I'll talk about what is incapacity and what is capacity. Um, whether or not a guardianship is appropriate or if there are other alternatives. Um, and the same thing goes for conservatorships. Is a conservatorship appropriate? Are there alternatives to conservatorship? Are there different types of guardianships and conservatorships? I will talk you through how to file for either of these two. Um, and then also go over the duties of a guardian and conservator. And then finally finish up with how much it costs to file for guardianship and conservatorship. And as I'm going, if you have any questions, uh, I understand you can type them in the chat box. And Susie will, um, she's more than welcome to go ahead and stop me and I'll address your question um, just as the presentation is going on. So first we'll start with definitions in uh, guardianship and conservatorship law. Uh, guardianship and conservatorships are part of the probate code and that's found in Title 62, uh, Article 5. And this is uh, Section 101 talking about definitions. So typically, um, Guardianships and conservatorships come up when someone is concerned about an individual, maybe a family member, who is unable or seems unable to make their own health care decisions, or unable to make their own financial decisions, or otherwise. So that person that we're concerned about is the alleged incapacitated individual, and that's also known as the AII. This is the adult who is the subject of the guardianship or conservatorship action. So guardian and conservator, they are two different fiduciary roles. Um, they each take care of the different aspects of the AII's well-being. The guardian is the person appointed by the court who makes decisions regarding a ward's health, education, maintenance, and support. And note that at the point a guardian is appointed for someone, they are no longer an AII, but they are now called a ward. And that is the adult for whom a guardian has been appointed. A conservator, um, so as the guardian takes care of someone's uh, medical well-being, a conservator takes care of their financial well-being. So that's a person appointed by the court to manage the assets of the protected person. And this can be an incapacitated individual, a minor, or a person in need of a special needs trust. Note that uh, similar to how a ward is appointed a guardian, a protected person is appointed a conservator. So it is just a little bit of a definition distinction right there. Um, I know this question was asked previously whether or not um, South Carolina can rec or does recognize guardianships for minors and we do not. The probate court does not have jurisdiction to appoint a guardian over a minor and that does have to be done through the family court. 
However, conservators can be appointed for minors. Um, and this is usually seen when a minor inherits an interest in real property. Um, they're actually mandated to be appointed when a minor receives assets that are valued over $15,000. Um, so that's just, it's good to keep in mind that which uh, some guardians can be, can only be adults, conservatorships can be any age. What is capacity? This is the million dollar question. And we actually don't get a definition for capacity in Article 5. So, um, so what I've taken right here, this is the definition of incapacity, and I've just inversed it. Um, we'll get to incapacity in the next slide. But basically, capacity is the ability to effectively receive, evaluate, and respond to information to make and communicate decisions such that a person can meet the essential requirements for their physical health and safety and manage their property or financial affairs or provide for their support or for the support of their legal dependents with and without support and assistance. So I really want to focus on um, those two words, support and assistance. So that includes estate planning documents that this individual might have executed earlier in their life. That can be a trust, a durable power of attorney, a power of attorney, or a living will. Um, support and assistance can include technology and devices, assist, um, including devices that allow the AI to communicate better or understand better. That could even be something as simple as a hearing aid. Um, receiving assistance with communication, having additional time and focused discussion to process information providing tailored information oriented to the comprehension level of the AII. Sometimes um, these individuals might just need a little more thorough um, understanding of what's going on. Um, you know, oftentimes us attorneys learn to speak in legalese and we have to be really aware of providing the information that we know and communicating it to individuals who don't have a law degrees in a way they can understand. Um, so kind of a similar thing there. And then um, finally, as, uh, assessing services from community organizations and government agencies. Um, I'll talk about ABLE South Carolina in a few slides, but they are a community organization that does assist um, individuals in making these decisions for themselves on their own without a guardian or conservator. Capacity continued. Um, so first off, capacity is always presumed no matter what someone's um, diagnoses are, what their state of mind is, whether or not they're abusing drugs, we always begin with the presumption that they do have capacity in every facet of their lives. Um, and to that point, there are different types of capacity. For example, someone might not have capacity to drive, but that does not mean they don't have capacity to enter into a contract. Um, if someone is incapacitated in one facet of their lives, that does not mean they just have a blanket incapacity over every aspect of every um, right and ability. Capacity is affected by medical diagnoses, by state of mind, by emotional well-being, by the time of the day, by substance abuse and use, and a host of other factors. An example of how time of day can affect capacity is um, found in those with Alzheimer's and dementia diagnoses. Often there's a phenomenon known as sundowning, which is where as the day progresses, um, individuals with these diagnoses um, tend to lose capacity. Um, they might become confused, they may show aggression, they may become extremely anxious. And while they may have capacity during the day, they may not have capacity during the night. Uh, number four, capacity is fluid. So even someone who is often incapacitated can have moments of lucidity. Um, I think a good example of that is someone who is often intoxicated. Um, if they do have a period of sobriety, they can regain capacity. Um, and because people can regain capacity, of course, that means incapacity is not always permanent. Um, someone might be in a coma and therefore incapacitated, but of course they can awake from the coma with full capacity. And it's also good to keep in mind that there's no universal standard for assessing capacity. Of course, there are psychological tests, there are physicians' uh, examinations, there are neurological tests, but it's really important to keep in mind that 
we are holistic. We need to approach capacity through a holistic lens. Um, people are affected by socioeconomic status, by cultural status. They might have um, environmental factors affecting their capacity. And you really just need to take a step back and look at the person as a whole and not just place uh, you know, place all of your assessment of their capacity into one psychological exam. So on the flip side, what is incapacity? And we do get a definition of incapacity from the probate code, and that's found at 625101. And as you might predict, incapacity is the inability to effectively receive, evaluate, and respond to information or make or communicate decisions regarding that person, even with a reasonably available support and assistance, cannot meet the essential requirements for their physical health, safety, or self-care, necessitating the need for a guardian, or managing their property or financial affairs, or providing for the support or the support of their legal defense, excuse me, dependents, necessitating the need for a protective order. So incapacity, um, is something the court will address in a guardianship or conservatorship action. They, the court will consider the, a physician's affidavit, um, any other psychological and neurological tests as we were just discussing. And um, the evidentiary bar is that a cl clear and convincing evidence. So that's quite a high bar. And if um, the judge determines while viewing that person holistically, that there is not clear and convincing evidence of incapacity, which of course is the inability to make and make decisions even with even with support and assistance, the court will issue a finding of incapacity. Sorry, just a moment to check my notes. So generally, if the court does not issue a finding of incapacity, the court won't be able to proceed um, in appointing a guardian or conservator. So at that point, the case is usually dismissed. We'll talk about who might need a guardian. Um, individuals over the age of 18, because remember guardianships are for adults only in South Carolina, that suffer from a mental or physical illness or disability, a mental deficiency, advanced age, chronic use of drugs or alcohol, or other situations where the individual um, might not might lack understanding, insight, or capacity to act on their own behalf. Is a guardianship appropriate? So the probate court will typically only appoint a guardian if there is no less restrictive alternative to ensure the well-being of the AII. And less restrictive alternative means um, that support and maintenance that can be provided the person to enable them to make their own informed decision. Appointment of a guardian should not be taken lightly because it, um, when a guardian is appointed, the AII is stripped of several of their own civil rights. And some of those rights will be vested in the guardian. Um, some of those rights that can be taken away from a ward includes the right to buy, sell, and transfer real property, to get married, to create a will, um, even to vote, to choose where to live, to make end-of-life decisions, etc. So it is um, very invasive, so it's good to strongly consider the less restrictive alternatives and the support and assistance that you can provide this person you might be concerned for before actually even considering a guardianship. Um, some of those less restrictive alternatives include HIPAA releases, which of course must be done when the AII does have capacity, but that's just a form where, that they can sign that allows their physicians to speak to an individual, a family member, or um, access the medical record. A living will is another good, less restrictive alternative. Of course, this also must be um, created when the while the AII has capacity. Um, this lets them make certain decisions regarding their end of life planning, with or without appointing an agent. Uh, so that's the difference between the living will and the healthcare power of attorney. 
because the healthcare power of attorney, while it also allows the individual to make elections concerning their end of life plan, they are appointing an agent, so someone they trust, often a family member, um, to make these decisions that the individual has um, already selected under this document when this individual is no longer to make their own decisions. Um, there's the Adult Healthcare Consent Act. That is a South Carolina law that allows um, individuals who have certain priority to make decisions for someone who is unable to consent. An unable to consent, um, that is determined by two physicians. They will, of course, assess this person who may be an alleged incapacitated individual. And if two physicians determine that this person cannot consent, they can turn to the Adult Health Care Consent Act. And the priority is uh, a guardian first, a health care power of attorney agent, of course, a spouse, an adult child, and a parent. And the list kind of goes on from there. So often, if um, this individual is in a situation where they can't consent to their own medical um, decisions, they can't make their own medical decisions, you can turn to the Adult Health Care Consent Act and you can kind of bypass the need for a guardianship there. Lastly, um, there's supportive decision making, which I just really learned about recently from Able South Carolina, and it's a really great option. Um, but it stems from the idea that almost everyone has relied on someone else to make, um, to assist them in making a decision. Like, for example, that would be me going to one of my mentors and asking them their opinion on a certain case or what they think of my argument. Um, and I, I allow their input to perhaps change what my argument is. So supportive decision making is a recognized alternative to guardianship through which people with disabilities use friends, family members, and professionals to help them understand situations and to make choices they face. Um, in supportive decision making, it can be drawn up in a legal document where this individual lists or chooses supporters, so maybe members of their family, friends, and identify which areas of their lives that they would like these supporters to assist them with. Um, maybe employment decisions, education, um, financial decisions, health decisions, etc. And what's interesting here is also the supporters do not make decisions for this individual, but they do help them um, understand all sides of maybe a uh, difficult decision they're coming up on uh, having to make, um, and they, they're there to talk them through it. So it's just a formal document of that, and we are going to watch a video on supportive decision making in just a moment. Hey, Jessica, before we start yeah. the video, there are a couple of questions if you want to go ahead and answer those. Sure, of course. Okay. One is, uh, kind of a two-part, can any kind of doctor do the determination and is a doctor the only person who can determine capacity? Okay, so I believe under the code it does have to be someone with a doctorate's degree. I think typically um, the primary care physician is the first person you should ask to complete a physician's affidavit. I know it doesn't have to be the primary care physician, I believe if it's not a primary care or excuse me, not a doctor, it would have to be. I'll, let me check the code and get back to you, but I'm wanting to say it actually does have to be a medical doctor. I think there can be a second one and the second one could be someone who is not a medical doctor, but I believe needs to be a nurse practitioner. So long story short. Yes, one has to be a medical doctor. <laughs> now it can be a doctor who is like a um, psychiatrist, right? I, I, I think they have to have an MD, but I will check. Okay. Got you. And I can get back and maybe I can post it um, when this is posted online. So I'll yeah. double okay. check that. And then um, what, uh, what is the physician affidavit available online? Yes, um, so I know depending on which probate court you're needing to file in, most often they will have their forms online and you will be able to um, go through that probate court's website 
Or however, if um, that probate court does not have a certain um, tailored physician's affidavit form to their county, you can always go to South Carolina courts uh, and search forms, search probate, and it should pop up there. And is can a letter replace that form or is the form required to be filled out by the doctor? Sure, yeah, sure. So I think a letter might be helpful. Um, and especially if you're just beginning your filings, it could certainly not harm you to have maybe um, just an affidavit from a physician that's not on this specific form to go ahead and file. Because I know sometimes it's difficult to actually obtain that physician's affidavit depending on what your relationship is with the AII, if you even know who their physicians are. Um, so I think what you should do is go ahead and get that letter if possible. And then if not, um, and I'll address it a little bit later on, once you've already opened or filed for guardianship and conservatorship, you can ask the court to appoint an examiner for you who will fill out that form. Okay, and one last question real quick before you move on, and that is, um, what about a baby? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Said, what about a baby when it comes to guardianship or conservatorship? Okay, sure. So a baby, um, anyone under 18 cannot have a guardianship through probate. That would have to be done through family court, and I'm not sure... Um, you know, maybe you're dealing with custody or something along that nature, but conservatorship could be done for a baby. For example, if a baby is born and it um, immediately inherits over $15,000, or maybe um, it was involved in a personal injury lawsuit and it receives that much money, you can appoint a conservator for that child to take care of those, that child's funds. Okay, thanks. That's all. Uh... I think what we have for now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no worries. And I will uh, seek clarification on the what type of physician. I know it has to be an MD. Okay. Let's hope my video works. If for some reason you're unable to hear this video, I will post a link of it later on. Um, that way you'll be able to go back and access it whenever you'd like. But this is just um, on supportive decision-making and what it looks like. South Carolina Supported Decision-Making Project, a collaborative effort between Aiken, South Carolina, Protection and Advocacy, Family Connection, and the Arc of South Carolina, funded by the South Carolina Development for Disabilities Council. A Better Way, Stories from the South Carolina Supported Decision-Making Project. A family's perspective. Yeah, I do not. Carl is an incredible 21 year old young man with a passion for life. I talk to nine from about because I talk to know the one nine. Um, excited about learning, um, excited about um, the world that he wants to live in. I can be a tool guy in him. Carl has some challenges with intellectual disability and occasionally. He needs me to explain something to him in a way that he can really, really get it. This is to me. If um, I go out and I get, I don't know, buy a car, I turn to my dad and I say, Dad, you know, this car, this car, and says better mileage, it says this. I go to a friend and they say, Oh, you got three kids, you need more space in the back seat, you're going to need this. And I get a lot of input from a lot of people. People look at me and say, oh, He has a lot of good stuff. He's willing to have supports from other people. Yeah, you know, when a person with intellectual disability needs supports, do we say well, they're disabled? And I don't see where the difference is. Yeah. It's important decision making is how do we, as all of us as human beings, surround ourselves with a group of people who will help us in the process of decision making that is needed. And for Carl, I'd like it to be a very clearly documented and structural way that that would happen. Yeah, I've been doing in classrooms. It amazes me how many parents have jumped straight to guardianship because they're afraid someone's going to take advantage of their child. This picture I did. So I think parents go into it wanting to make sure that they can get medical information on their children, still help make medical decisions for their children, make sure that somebody doesn't take advantage of them by any 
financially and doesn't take advantage of them with decision making. So they think the cure all is guardianship. The most painful thing for me as a supporter of these is special needs is for so many years, all I promoted is guardianship. And that um, I did it because I wanted to protect our kids. I wanted our children to have a safe place to be. Um, but I really did attack on fear. I really counseled parents to take away their children's civil rights. I had a change of heart um, when Abel, South Carolina, sat down and met with me the first time, and Kimberly, the executive director, looked at me and she said, Do you see, do you want Carl special or do you want equal? And um, that changed everything for me. Do you want to get married one day? Yeah, I would. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If I don't let me do it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. You're smiling real big. Right. <laughs> Fear keeps us from moving forward. This is from the disability world or anything. Um, but the faith in the future moves the person forward. So I would rather walk in faith than I would walk in fear. And faith says, okay, I believe that there is a way to make this work. There are supports out there. You know, there's art, there's aid, there's actually there's family connection. There's a group of people out there that are willing to surround people and help them think through that process. For more information, please visit SC Supported Decision Making org or call able south carolina at 803-779-5121 right so like i said if um you'd like to go back and rewatch this video or if maybe you couldn't hear it properly i'll make sure this gets posted underneath the description of our YouTube video. So if you decided that you think a guardianship is appropriate for this person you, um, you're concerned about, you need to think about who has priority to serve as a guardian. And that's found in South Carolina Code Annotated 62-5308. And this is um, in descending priority. So the first person to have priority would be someone who was appointed guardian before. Um, that does not include a temporary or emergency guardianship, but it might mean someone who was appointed a guardian for a ward in a different state. Second is a person nominated to serve as a guardian by the alleged incapacitated individual if they have sufficient capacity to make that choice. Third is an agent designated in a health in a power of attorney. Fourth is a spouse of the AII or a person nominated in the deceased spouse will. Next is an adult child of the AII and then a parent of the AII or the person nominated as the guardian in the deceased parent's will. The person nearest kinship to the AII, the person with whom the AII resides outside of a healthcare facility, a group home, a home or shelter, or a prison, a person nominated by a healthcare facility for the AII, and then any other person considered suitable by the court. So what type of guardianship is appropriate? There are four different types of guardianship in South Carolina. The first is emergency, and that's really appropriate when um, you're afraid this alleged incapacitated individual is being exploited, is being abused. Um, if for some reason their safety is in question, this can get filed and get in front of a judge pretty quickly. Um, the physician's affidavit that you have to obtain for an emergency guardianship is quite a bit shorter than the one required for a, a permanent uh, guardianship. So you um, will be able to see the differences in those two forms if you search for them online. Emergencies are um, short in nature. Of they might just be appointed for the time for the time it takes to resolve that emergency, but um, they could be they could be eventually converted to a permanent guardianship. 
a temporary guardianship is similar to an emergency guardianship, but in situations where um, it's not the war, the alleged incapacitated individual safety is not necessarily um, a concern right at this moment. Temporary guardianships are able to get in front of a judge a little bit sooner than permanent also. So it's good to, if you, if a guardian should be appointed relatively quickly, but not immediately. Um, I recommend filing one of those. And then similarly, temporaries can be converted over to permanent. Permanent guardianships um, are as they sound, they are permanent. They only terminate upon the death of the ward, upon the ward regaining capacity, or if the guardian is removed. Then lastly, successor guardianship, um, you know, again, as it sounds, if there was a guardian, but maybe the guardian themselves passed away or became incapacitated, someone else in that order of priority list could petition to be the successor guardian. Hey, Jessica, as you're moving on up to conservatorship, there was one more question. And sure. I think we'll answer it in the rest of your presentation a little bit further on. Um, but okay. I did this listener to know um, we see that question. Um, and it says, if you have a kinship caregiver that's seeking guardianship, what do they need to do? And I think later in your presentation, you do get in the specifics of how that procedure operates. Is that right? I do. Yes, yes. So later on, I'll explain exactly how to file for guardianship and conservatorship. If you are, um, I mean, anyone can technically file for either. It's just priority will be given by the court to people who may be ranked higher in this statute than you. So let's see, kinship is fourth from the bottom. So you still would be in a position of priority and you would still follow the same process that I'll describe later on. But for now, we're going to uh, switch over to conservatorships. They are kind of similar, but of course, they have their differences. And then after I talk through conservators, then I'll get into how to file. So who may need a conservator? Um, of course, an individual, individual over the age of 18 or, um, of course, under the age of 18 who suffers a mental or physical illness or disability, a mental deficiency, um, maybe advanced age, chronic use of drugs and alcohol, the same kind of considerations for a guardian. Just remember that a conservator can be appointed for a minor also. Um, this would include a minor who might have a mental deficiency. Um, but really, a, conser a minor wouldn't really need a conservator unless they are, um, if they own any property, if they have a business interest. Or again, as I mentioned earlier, if they receive property that's valued over $15,000. Um, finally, a conservator can be appointed for someone in need of a special needs trust who are unable to set up the trust themselves. A conservator can be a person can petition to be a conservator, be appointed a conservator, and create a trust for the alleged incapacitated individual. Um, kind of just following the same line of questions, is a conservatorship appropriate? Again, a probate court will usually only appoint a conservator if there's no less uh, restrictive alternative. And for conservatorships, for less restrictive alternatives include um, being appointed someone's representative payee to manage their social security benefits, being appointed someone's uh, VA fiduciary to manage those benefits, to set up an ABLE account, an ABLE account is um, a tax beneficial savings account for individuals with disabilities. They must be established before the individual is 26. A durable power of attorney, which of course must be created while the person has capacity to contract. And this is where that individual can appoint an agent, um, someone who they really trust to manage their business affairs for them. Um, we always counsel people that this is a very powerful document. Um, basically, it's duplicating yourself. So whoever you appoint as your agent will have the exact same ability to sell your property, to access your bank account, to manage your finances as you do. Um, of course, unless you limit it in any way in the document. Joint bank accounts is another restrictive alternative. Um, also should be kind of careful with those. Only add someone's name onto the account if you completely, absolutely trust them. 
um, because they do have unfettered access to your bank account. Um, they can add money, they can take money away. Because they're a joint owner, that also means if he passed away, they would actually um, inherit or become owners, sole owners of that bank account. And finally, uh, trust. If, um, you know, of course, again, while this person has capacity, they can work with an attorney and create a trust and appoint a trustee to protect and safeguard their assets. I'm sorry, this slide is kind of wordy, um, but also who has priority to serve as a conservator. This is 62-5408, kind of similar. Um, the first is the person who is previously appointed a conservator, um, other than a temporary or emergency conservator who was appointed a guardian of property or other fiduciary for a protected person by another court. Second is a person nominated to serve as conservator by the AII, of course, if they're able to do so, and if it's in the case of a minor, if he or she is over 14 years of age. Third is an agent um, designated in a power of attorney. Fourth is the spouse of the alleged incapacitated individual, then the adult child, and then the parent, and then the person near skinship, and then the person with um, whom the AII resides with, um, not including someone who's in a, who works in a healthcare facility, a group home, homeless shelter, a prison, et cetera. Um, a person nominated by a healthcare facility for the AII, and finally, any other person being suitable by the court. Okay, a couple more questions um, okay. before you move on. And you may get this a little bit, but I just wanted to um, go ahead and mention it. Um, okay. because I think this is more of a summary of some of the things you just said than it is a question, but just sort of, I think, a, a viewer wanting to confirm. And of course. Say, so a guardian controls the health care choices and the conservatorship controls the finances. So are both yeah. needed? Right, so that really depends on the needs of the alleged incapacitated individual. Um, a person can have a guardian and a conservator or neither or both. Um, it really just depends because sometimes, as I said, capacity, um, if someone is incapacitated in one facet of their lives, does not mean they're incapacitated in all others. So maybe they need help making or they're unable to make informed healthcare decisions on their own, but they don't quite need a conservator um, and vice versa. Maybe they need, maybe they're unable to protect their own assets, but um, physically their well-being is completely fine, so they don't need a guardian. Um, so I really, I have to give you that answer, but it depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and one other um, quick one. Uh, so the durable power of attorney is kind of the same as a conservatorship, except that it needs to be made when the person has capacity. And so then the conservatorship aspect, is it needed? Right, right. So if someone executes a durable power of attorney while they have capacity and they appoint this agent, this agent will be able to manage the individual's financial affairs to the point that they are limited, limited in that document. If and when that pers the person who executed the document becomes incapacitated, that agent still functions as an agent as a, under a durable power of attorney. Um, so in that situation, typically a conservator isn't needed and that's why having that document is a good way to avoid the need for a conservator later on. Okay, well, that's all the questions for the moment, but I appreciate all the good questions that everyone's asking. I encourage you to keep putting questions down there in the question box, and uh, Jessica, I'll let you continue on. All righty. Okay, so if you believe a conservatorship is appropriate, there are several different kinds you can file for. There are special conservatorships, and that's where a conservator is needed for a very specific reason for a very specific amount of time. So that's if someone needs a conservator appointed to maybe consolidate their bank accounts. So that way they only have one bank account and not five or six floating out there. That conservator can be appointed to do that one task and then they are no longer conservator. 
Emergency conservator is similar to emergency guardian. Um, those can get before a judge pretty quickly. And they are used when you have concerns that someone else is abusing the AII's assets, if they're being exploited, if um, you think they're about to make a financial decision that's just um, totally irresponsible, maybe they're looking into scams, something like that, you can file for emergency conservatorship. Temporary conservatorship is similar to special conservator, but not quite as restricted. Again, it can get in front of a judge uh, quicker than a petition for a permanent conservator, but it could be converted into a permanent conservatorship later on. Um, you can request whatever reason you might think this person needs a conservator, you can include that in the temporary petition. And um, this is useful when maybe the AIR has bills coming up, but they're unable to pay them themselves. The bills aren't due immediately, but you know they're coming, so it might be appropriate to file that temporary conservatorship. Permanent conservatorship, um, as same with permanent guardian, it is a, the petitioner is appointed conservator for the foreseeable future. That is until the ward passes away, um, until if it's a minor, until the minor turns 18, unless there are extenuating circumstances, um, if the minor even upon becoming an adult is still unable to manage their assets um, or the conservator is removed. Finally, there's a successor conservator chef. So if there's already a conservator appointed for someone who is no longer able to serve, whether um, they've been removed, they have died, they're incapacitated themselves or simply choose to step down, um, someone will need to file for successor conservatorship. Okay, so this is how to open a guardianship and conservatorship. I do want to give you a caveat that I'm going to go through um, the statutory requirements to open a guardianship and conservatorship. However, each court might require different forms, um, different additional information. So although you can find all court forms on SouthCarolinaCourts.org, um, you do need to check with the probate court you're going to file with and make sure that you have met all the requirements. Richland County has uh, actually created their own guardianship conservatorship packet. So it includes instructions, it includes all the forms you need, um, it includes a checklist on each step and it just walks you through the filing. It's super awesome and I will provide you a link to that. Um, whether or not you're filing in Richland County, it is um, a really good guide. So first you have to decide which probate court you need to file in. And that would be the county where the AII resides or is physically present. So if the AII is in Greenville County, you'll need to go to the Greenville County Probate Court, ensure um, what their application process or petition process is, and then go by that. For guardianship, you file a summons and petition for guardianship. Those in any form that I mentioned can be found on the South Carolina Courts website or can be picked up by the probate court. Um, so you file summons and petition for the type of guardianship you are seeking, uh, emergency, temporary, permanent, successor. The forms for each of those look a little different. So just be sure um, when you're selecting which form to choose, it's just in the name, um, just, but just be aware of that. There is a $150 filing fee for that summons and petition. Um, you can request it to be waived by filing what's called an informa pauperis motion. And that's just you telling the court that you are um, unable to pay this filing fee and the court can um, consider that affidavit or certification and issue an order to that effect. Uh, for guardianships, you must submit a criminal background check, usually a sled check. Um, and in the packet, the Richland County Prepare, there are instructions on how to do that. It's pretty easy, but you do have to pay a small fee. For conservatorships, um, similarly, you file summons and petition for the type of conservatorship you are seeking. There is a, uh, that same $150 filing fee. In addition to a criminal background check, you must also file a credit report. There are several different credit um, agencies that you can request a report from. You do have one free credit report a year. So you can just go ahead and pull that and provide that to the court. 
if you are filing for both conservatorship and guardianship, you don't have to file two petitions. There's what's called a dual summons and petition, um, which you can find online, and it only requires one filing fee. So you'd only pay 150 instead of 150 for guardian and 150 for conservator. Next, you file the examiner's report and affidavit regarding capacity. That is the physician's um, affidavit that we've kind of already touched on. This, uh, this document um, provides health information on the AII. The physician um, conducts an evaluation on what abilities they believe the AII can do on their own, what they need assistance with. And on the final page, they make a declaration of whether or not they believe the AII has capacity. Um, as I said before, um, if you have a good relationship with the AII, if you know who their healthcare providers are, I've not really seen much difficulty in someone like that actually just going to the AII's hospital, to their physician, to their primary care provider, and requesting they do this examination and complete this report. Um, be sure you get the original back from the physician and make sure it's notarized because sometimes they just like to fill it out and not notarize it, um, but the court will kick it back. If you don't have a good relationship with the AII, um, if you maybe don't know who their primary care physician is, if you don't know another physician who would be able to complete this exam for them, you can request the court to appoint an examiner and they may or may not do so. Additionally, make sure you file copies of the proposed guardian or conservator's ID, uh, a driver's license, and your social security card. Of course, um, the court does keep this completely confidential, but they need it not only to verify your identity, but to complete any further background investigation. You should also file copies of the AI's ID if you have it, and their social, social security card if you have it. And finally, the court um, typically requests a photo of the AII, a recent photo. Of course, um, aside from the examiner's report, some courts require different things as, as far as proof of identity, um, photographs, things like that. So um, again, just check with the probate court you're deciding to file with. Okay, so next, you serve the summons and petition on all interested parties. Interested parties would be the AII. Anyone you have identified who has a higher or equal priority to serve than you based on that list I provided earlier. And often I've seen courts require you serve the AII's other closest family members. Um, so recently I had a case where my client was applying for um, or seeking conservatorship and a spouse who would have priority, right? But the court wanted me to go ahead and serve um, the couple's children. That way they can be involved in the case. Um, so just be aware of that. You will need to identify all of those individuals. And of course you can serve um, through certified mail return receipt requested restricted delivery um, through process server, et cetera. Um, I know there was a question submitted beforehand about who has standing to contest a conservatorship or guardianship, and the answer to that is um, the interested parties. So, of course, the AII has the ability to contest the guardianship. Um, of course, anyone who has equal or higher priority to you to serve can contest, and also um, the AI's closest family members can contest. So they would do that by filing an answer to your summons and petition, and then um, they have to do that within 30 days after you serve them. They will file their answer with the court, and they'll also serve a copy of that onto you. You must serve a notice of the right to counsel on the AII. Um, so a notice of the right to counsel, that's, as it sounds, it's letting the AI know um, to the extent that they can that they do have the right to a court-appointed attorney. Um, they have the right to be represented by an attorney in these proceedings. Um, they have 15 days from the time you serve the notice of right to counsel 
And once the court receives, excuse me, once the court receives proof of service that you did serve the notice of right to counsel on the AII, they will actually appoint an attorney. That attorney will, will have a chance to meet with the AII. Um, I think it's always helpful if you work with the AII's attorney, they might need um, their current address. If they're in a facility, they might um, need you to give, if they're in a nursing home, maybe give the staff a heads up that they're coming. I know with COVID, a lot of um, facilities have very short visitation windows. So you might need to help the AI's attorney figure out what those windows are. Um, if the AII's attorney meets with the AII and determines that they are unable to effectively assist with their own legal representation, if they're not able to really vocalize their own opinion, if they're not able to tell their attorneys what they want done, the attorney can actually uh, ask the court to be relieved as attorney and instead serve as guardian ad litem. The guardian ad litem's role is a little different because they are looking out for the best interests of the AII instead of necess just necessarily what the AI's desires are, which of course does play a role in the best interests, but not the only role. The guardian um, can talk to anyone involved in the situation, other family members, um, the petitioner, all respondents, um, healthcare providers, et cetera. And um, if the attorney isn't stepping down and serving as the guardian ad litem, a guardian ad litem is appointed um, within 13, excuse me, 30 days of receipt of that proof of service. So sometimes an AI will have an attorney and the guardian ad litem, or sometimes an AI would have an attorney who then steps down and then steps up to be guardian ad litem. I, when situations allow it, I do prefer to go that way because um, you're only paying one professional instead of two. And I'll get to costs in a moment. If the court decides it needs more um, evidence on its own, it can appoint a physician examiner um, to have an additional affidavit completed. So once that's done and once the attorney and or the guardian or item have had a chance to meet with the AII, the court will schedule a hearing. At the hearing, they'll review the petition, the guardian of items report, the physician's affidavit, and they'll hear testimony from the petitioner, from the AI's attorney, and any other interested parties. At that point, the court um, may or may not ask each participating individual their own questions, but they're there to assess whether or not the petitioner is the proper person to serve as guardian and conservator and they will assess the evidence regarding the AII's capacity or incapacity. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the evidentiary standard is clear and convincing, but it's fairly high. And then the court will issue an order um, potentially declaring incapacity, naming the guardian and or, and or conservator, and then specifically enumerating the rights the AII gets to keep, the rights the AII um, has transferred to the guardian or conservator. At that point, the court will issue its order um, on the record usually, and then they will do it in writing. And then they will issue certificates of appointment for the guardian and conservator. What are the duties of a guardian? Um, there are many, uh, and you can find them in 625309, but Essentially, the guardian cares for the, the maintenance well-being of the AII. Um, there are some statutory, some additional statutory requirements, such as the plan of care. That the guardian must file the plan of care within 30 days of being appointed. This is another form that can be found online, um, but of course, it just details where the where the um, which is now a ward, of course, not no longer an AII, is going to live. Um, what kind of health care requirements the ward needs, how those requirements are going to be met, etc. There's also an annual report of guardian. The guardian must file the annual report once a year, and that should include an updated picture of the AII. 
This will need to address any major changes with the award status, um, maybe additional diagnoses, decline in health, um, et cetera. So guardianships, um, permanent guardianships, of course, exist until the ward passes away or the guardian is removed. A guardian can be removed if they are not doing what they should be, if they themselves are abusing or exploiting the ward. Um, and it is good to keep in mind that the guardian is subject to the powers, the court's contempt powers, so they can be ruled in if they miss a plan of care or if they don't file this annual report. And then lastly, the last duty of the guardian will just be to close the guardianship. Um, and that's appropriate if the ward becomes capable of handling their own affairs again, um, if the ward dies, or if the ward moves and the guardianship file in this state needs to be closed and transferred to another state. Similarly, what um, are the duties of conservator? And those can be found in 62.5.414 through 625416. Conservators do have to file an inventory and appraisement. Um, that's just the detailed list of all the assets the um, protected person possesses. That has to be done within 30 days of being appointed. Also, do within 30 days, it's a financial plan, um, similar to a budget, but where the conservator details the protected person's bills, um, financial needs, and kind of just breaks it down. There is an annual accounting. Um, first, there is an interim accounting that's due six months, and then after that six months, that's due every year. And then, um, of course, finally, there's closing. If the protected person becomes capable of handling their own affairs, the conservator must file an application for relief to be stepped down. Um, it's appropriate to close the conservatorship, not only when someone becomes capable of handling their own affairs, but in the case of a minor, if they turn 18, um, for anyone if they pass away, or if the protected person moves, that conservatorship needs to close in this state and then be moved to another state. For conservators, it's good to note that um, judges will usually require a conservator to be bonded or to place the protected person's assets into a protected restricted account. Um, only usually in rare circumstances does a conservator not have to post bond or place the assets in a restricted account um, because the conservator has quite a bit of court oversight um, because the assets of the protected person are there to be protected. So just keep that in mind. So what are the costs? What does it cost? So um, there's a summons and petition fee, $150. As I said before, if you're filing for dual guardianship and conservatorship, that is just $150. It does not become $300. Service fees vary by the type of service you decide to use. Um, you know, it could be $15 for certified mail. It could be $50 for personal service. It could be more than that. The petitioner may be ordered to pay the AII's court appointed attorney and guardian ad litem. So you really need to be certain that you believe this person is incapacitated and in need of a guardian and conservatorship. Because if there is not a finding of incapacity, you may be ordered to pay the attorney and guardian ad litem's fees. Uh, typically, they're pretty reasonable. Most probate courts, I believe, have a cap on how much um, the attorney and or guardian ad litem can bill per hour but that's just something to be aware of. And of course, if um, there is a finding of incapacity and there is a guardian and conservator appointed, the court can order that those costs be paid from the ward or protected person's assets. So even if you maybe pay for them up front, you might be able to be reimbursed or they would just, those payments would come straight from the protected person or ward's account. And then, of course, there are various, various filing fees for guardianship reports, conservatorship accountings, et cetera. You can find, usually find fee schedules on probate court's website. 
these are just some resources that I've mentioned previously, um, a link to the probate code, the Adult Health Care Consent Act, the supportive decision making, including ABLE South Carolina. The court forms link is where you can go if you search probate forms, and then um, the Richland County Guardianship Conservatorship Packet. And I think that's all I have, Susie, if you have any more questions for me. Yeah, we do have a few uh, more questions. A couple of them are short, so let me give you those first. Uh -huh. um, one is, does the guardian ad litem have to be an attorney? Why does the guardian ad litem have to be an attorney? It says, does the guardian ad litem uh, have to be okay. an attorney? Um, I don't believe so. I believe that um, it could be a lay guardian. I know that probate courts usually have a list of guardians that they choose from, that they rotate through when they're appointing them. And I've mostly known them to be attorneys, but I don't know for sure if they have to be. I agree. I don't think they have to be an attorney, but I do think typically um, there are attorneys who offer to do that. So um, right. it's always helpful, I think, to have someone who has that legal background. Um, I here's think a question. Um, why a credit report? I understand uh, a SLED report, but what's the purpose of getting a credit report when it comes to the conservatorship? Sure. So when the court is determining if the petitioner is a proper person to be a conservator, they have to make sure that this conservator is someone who can responsibly handle the protective person's assets. So your credit score um, is a factor. That doesn't mean if you have a poor one to not apply, but it does mean that the judge might ask you questions at the hearing about your credit score. They want to check your credit report to make sure that you are responsible for your own finances before they appoint you over someone else's. Good answer. Uh, here's another one. Um, let's see, I, oh, someone said, I do know someone that is not an attorney that's a guardian ad litem through probate court. Okay. I think that's okay. definitely probably right. Here's one, how much is a bond or is it based off the total assets of the person or the, I guess the um, AI? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. So usually it is based on their assets. Uh, so when you petition, fill, out, fill out the petition for conservatorship, there'll be a section that asks about the AII's assets. You might not know all of them, but you could at least, um, you need to disclose them to the extent you're aware of them at that point. And at the hearing, the judge will set a bond based on the value of those assets. Great. Okay. Um, I know we're out of time. I've got a couple more questions here and then we'll let our audience know about what's coming up next on Level Up Law. Um, the good. question is, uh, if a kinship, this may be a little too detailed of our person today, but let's give it a shot. Okay. Um, if a kinship caretaker has a child from North Carolina, this sounds like a law school exam question. Oh, no. <laughs> if a kinship caretaker has a child from North Carolina, and the child resides with the grandmother in South Carolina, would they uh, file in South Carolina? And this uh, um, audience member is saying they think that that is, would be the case. Right, so if the child is living in South Carolina right now, um, regardless of if he or she was from North Carolina, I believe that would make South Carolina the correct state. Okay, and then also if the father is deceased and the mother is alive but not uh, around or in the picture due to drug usage and the child mm -hmm. needs surgery immediately, which guardianship would she file under? And I'm assuming that's talking about the grandmother and I guess that would be, wouldn't it, the nearest person in kinship? Right, so that would be nearest person who is willing and able to accept and depending on the surgery i think the question said it the surgery needed done very quickly or emergency I, I think the guard the answer would be the grandma could file and should file for emergency conservatorship but she would have to name the mother as a respondent and the mother would probably have would definitely have to be served 
Okay, very good. One last question. Um, uh, and this question, it says, who serves as the public guardian in the state of South Carolina, or is there no such thing? I am not familiar with there being something called a public guardian uh, in South Carolina. I'm not sure either. I haven't heard that term. Um, yeah. uh, sorry about that. Okay. Well, I think it looks like, let me just double check. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the questions we have. And thanks to our audience members for all those great questions. Um, Jessica, I do want to thank you so much for such an excellent presentation. That certainly was a lot of detailed content there that you know might not be covered in something that was more of a general overview. So um, we definitely uh, appreciate a great presentation with some really good detail. Um, and thanks to all of you who joined us today. We really do appreciate your interest in this subject matter as well as others that we talk about here on Level Up Law. Remember, this is a series of three webcasts every Tuesday at noon where we educate the public on some of the most common legal issues that we see here at South Carolina Legal Services. All of these webcasts can be found on our YouTube channel. Just go to the Level Up Law playlist there and you'll find them. If you found Jessica's uh, presentation helpful today, which I'm sure you did, be sure to go there to South Carolina Legal Services on YouTube and give her presentation a thumbs up and share the broadcast with others that you know might find it helpful. And if you go ahead while you're there and subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and sign up for alerts, you'll get a notification every time we post a new episode. Now, if you have an issue and you need legal assistance, and can't afford a lawyer, you may be eligible for our free legal representation here. And we do want you to apply for help if that's the case. The information is here on the screen. You can call our intake office personnel. We're standing by Monday through Thursday, nine to six. But you can also apply online and we even have a Level Up Law uh, episode that walks you through that process. Uh, an easy way to see what's coming up each week is to check out our South Carolina Legal Services Facebook page. And also you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and that information is also here on your screen. Now, next week, we will be talking about solar panels. And that is part two of a two part series. You can find um, part one, uh, on the Level Up Law playlist there at our YouTube channel if you want to take a look at that before uh, listening to part two of that series. And that's been very informative when it comes to solar panels, signing contracts for them, and the scams that are out there that you need to be aware of. So thanks again, Jessica, for a great presentation. We look forward to having all of you in the audience back with us next week. And that concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everybody.